little story. The title is The Fiery Secret. Growing up in a funeral home, there was always somebody dead in my house. I would like to take you back 50 years to a small New England town. Spending my childhood on the second floor of the funeral home provided a unique view of the practice of mourning the dead. I am only 10 years old. Visitors came and went in a somber fashion to view their friend or family member before that final ride. There were many refined and decorated rooms appropriate for the display in a casket, be it open or closed. On off hours, I was corralled into relocating the stock of this lovely cherry, walnut, even bronze caskets coached to safely guide them through the narrow doorway. I was told to protect their corners with my little hands so there would be no scratches. I must admit, I did get a pinch or two, but Father wasn't concerned about that. During services, I was not allowed to be around, and I was to be very quiet and not yell or laugh or play my transistor radio. Often heard was the organ music coming from the rooms below as it soothed the sad guests. At this moment, I am alone at the top of a dark stairway, cloaked with the chill of winter, a cold draft stealing up my nightgown. I am standing stiffly afraid to move, and I don't know why. The ridges of the tread underneath dig into my bare feet. I am so scared trying to make sense of the wail in the distance. Brightly lit, far below, and in spite of freezing temperatures, the door was wide open. The wail has come to an abrupt halt at my house. I can see a single file trail of strangers with loud male voices shouting and barking commands. A staccato of footsteps thud, announcing their presence. The fire department charged into the house in full dress. They wore helmets and long protective coats. They wielded axes and hauled yards of black snake-like hoses, which immediately pulsed with cold gushes of water. The icy wind whipped ahead of them, boomeranging the acrid order of the smoke as it wafted and billowed, permeating my nostrils. The firefighters clambered awkwardly about the room, searching out incendiary sources and making every effort to extinguish the blaze. I held on to the railing, an illusion of safety, compelled to inch my way down the stairs for a peek around the corner. My eyes widened as I viewed the curtains rippling and the flames flared and snapped and crackled in the window. It was a paralyzing sight. This had been a cold, wintry evening. It was the holiday season. A passerby had been the first to detect the fire and made the emergency call. He then pounded on the door to alert us at the disaster. It was so out of character to see my father dashing across the front room in a blur, feet never touching the floor. It was a freeze-frame scene. His elbows were bent. His legs were in flight, suspenders taut. My dad was up to any challenge. This time, he needed help. The fire had started from some very old electric Christmas candles, which occupied every window of the house. The curtains ignited and went from smoke to flame swiftly, licking away all the Jack Frost etching from the paint. Good fortune prevailed as the blaze was contained to one room. Soon, we had nothing but soggy, steamy, and charcoal-stained walls and carpet. There was an array of upended furniture and a new ghastly framing of each window. The candles were sadly toppled and hanging from the casement like so many dead soldiers. Having done their job, Firemen paraded out, lugging their equipment and those long black snakes, returning to engine 19 in the driveway. I had never experienced 
such excitement and fear at the same time. I lay in bed that night, replaying the scene of the evening, and finally I closed my eyes and fell asleep. The following morning, I snuck downstairs to review the damage. It was strikingly real, with the smell of smoke lingering in the air. Whatever shall happen to this poor room, I wondered. My father already had a plan. First was to remove all the wallpaper and carpet. Next, I watched him as he scraped out the corner closet. Inside, it smelled like smoke and black with soot. Cleaning this took a great deal of effort, and with one vigorous swipe, the rear wall of the closet moved. Another swipe, and the rear, pan rear panel slid to one side. It was a secret space, a wonderful hideout. I had no idea how close to the truth I was. I guessed, and my heart sped. How could that be? What was in there? This house had been here for hundreds of years. I had lived here my whole life. Even my father was shocked at this revelation. There is certain to be more to this story, and it will be a rich addition to the history of this building. Immediate investigation disclosed a secret stairway to a tunnel. This was indeed a safe house from the time of the Underground Railroad. Evidence found in the tunnel was a button from the uniform of a Confederate soldier. Their discards were often handed down to the slaves. This button was passed on to me on my father. Snagged on the cold, damp wall was a shred of Osnaburg, which is a coarse wool from which the slaves made their clothing. I clung to my father closely. Shadows on the dusty walls danced with the memories of stories past. He held the only source of light, as there was no electricity in those days. Further along still were some footprints in the dry, caked earth showing the presence of those who had traversed the secret way. We know that the abolitionists would hang lanterns in their windows to show the slaves which, say, which houses were safe. This is perhaps the origin of the candles in the windows, which almost last led to the current demise of this grand edifice. The end result has provided the big reveal. This would never have occurred the candles in the window, otherwise welcoming candles, had not shorted out to expose the fiery secret. Hey, hey. Oh.